us. You see, we were right for the last eight years. Can't you see? And therefore, we are good and pure, and we are innocent. It's not so. It's not so. Now, if we're going to move away from that knee-jerk criticism, what it means is that we have to be willing to actually be, actually be participants in our government. We have to be willing to be participants in governing we, the people. <clears throat> and things have changed in Washington in the last 30 days, let me tell you. In the course of the eight years preceding, our Washington office, which is staffed by an extraordinary group of, uh, of young adults, long uni young Unitarian Universalist adults, ha uh, in the past eight years, we were invited to participate in an administration-sponsored conversation or briefing exactly once. In the last 30 days, our Washington office staff is having to decide which invitations they can accept because we simply don't have the person power to sit at all of the tables. I was invited to the prayer service which followed the inaugura uh, inauguration at the, at the National Cathedral uh, this year. I didn't get invitations in either of the last elections. So we are going to be at the table in ways that we're not accustomed to being. How will we show up? You know, in, in June, the General Assembly of the Association will be held in Salt Lake City. And each year at the General Assembly, we hold up as major a public witness event as we can. This year, in conversation with our congregations in the Salt Lake Basin, the subject will be immigration reform, a place where there desperately needs to be a liberal religious voice raised in support of both love and sanity. And for the first time, we will not be witnessing alone. So we'll be joined by leaders of the Catholic Church, which has as long, longer actually, a record of public witness on this issue than have we, and by leaders of the Mormon Church in their hometown of Salt Lake City. This we could not have imagined even a few years ago. And what it means, among other things, is that we have to, we have to give up our automatic assumption that, that if you don't agree with us about every jot and tittle of our theology and our social policy, we're not interested in working with you. Because as part of government now, that process of governing, we need to be effective. And that means that we need to find those places where we can partner with folks who have not been at the top of our Rolodex for several generations. <laughs> Let me give you another example, because this is not just the Obama era. The evangelical Christian community is not one that I'll bet most of you have a great deal of contact with. Perhaps I'm wrong, and I hope that I am. But three years ago, that community put out a statement on global warming, which is, from their theological perspective, every bit as good as anything Unitarian Universalism has had to say on the subject. And once they did, I found myself showing up on podiums with evangelical Christian leaders that I had never met before. And we'd do the thing, you know, we'd exchange business cards. Hello, I'm from the Unitarian Universalist Association. I'm from the Evangelical Christian. Really? Maybe we should sit down and talk. Maybe we should sit down and talk. We have to give up our habit of accepting divisiveness as the way things have to be. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And there's a critical role here, a critical role for the liberal religious community. You know, we're not, uh, we're not charged with, with writing laws and developing policy, but we are charged to raise a religious voice. 
and, and hold up that image of the beloved community toward which we want our nation and our world to move, to hold it up so that that vision can help inform the discourse in the public square. The politics of the possible, if we're not willing to do that, will compromise too low. If that vision is not held up, the compromise will be between this position and that position. We need the, and there will be compromise, my friends, but we need that compromise to have a higher bar, closer, closer to the opinion that we have as we stand on the side of love. Let me give you an example. The living wage in this country was finally raised a couple of years ago. Uh, here in California, you have a higher living wage than the national average, but the na national average was raised to six dollars and a quarter a couple of years ago, finally, having not been raised in a dozen years. And, and those of us on the progressive side said, you know, that was good, but, but now we need to actually take the living wage up to a living wage rather than a poverty wage, believing that, that if you work full time, if you work full time and have that kind of a job, it should keep you out of poverty, not keep you in it. And so, and so we're in agreement with the Obama administration. They want to increase the minimum wage too. They want to take it up to $9.50 in the 2011 year. Now we have a couple of options. We can stand on the sidelines and quietly applaud because that would be a good thing to increase the minimum wage. Or we can go to that image of the beloved community and remind all of us, including the administration, that if you raise the minimum wage to $9.50, it would still be below the real purchasing power of the minimum wage in 1968. And we need to say, that's too low a bar. That 950 in 2011 is too low a bar. Let's at least take it to, to, to $10 in 2010, which would make the purchasing power at least comparable to what it was in 1968. It's a complicated kind of role because it does invite that kind of automatic criticism that I was complaining about before. So we have to <clears throat> find a way to raise our voice as participants in the conversation rather than as strident critics from outside. Strident critics from outside. I think we can do it. I really do think we can do it if we're willing to steadfastly and faithfully stand on the side of love and inform our voice in the public square by that commitment to equality and justice which is at the heart of our faith. And I know that we will find friends and allies out there in the religious world that are not in our Rolodex right now if we're willing to raise that voice and keep it grounded in that way. I want to close by talking about the role of the church and particularly the liberal church in these days when we're pulled between hope and anxiety. It's complicated because what I'm going to ask you to do is to make this sanctuary and this church and the other churches who may be represented here today places where everyone can bring their whole selves where each and every one of us can bring the good wolf and the evil wolf of our nature and find in this place support for that good wolf who stands for love and forgiveness and compassion because there are precious few other places in our world that encourage the presence of both those wolves. We need to be that place. We need to find a way, a find a way to find a way to be grounded enough 
in who we are and what we believe in so that we can actually take America forward, not just take it back. So may it be, and amen.